Can you heal from abuse? What do I do after leaving my narcissist? What does a healthy relationship look like? These concerns cross the minds of over 20 people every minute, over 28,800 people every day. And the sad fact is, we still don't talk about it enough. Healing from emotional abuse isn't a band-aid situation, but it doesn't have to take years either. The lives of millions of other survivors around the world have been impacted by their narcissist. Yours doesn't have to. To show you how to live a free, confident, and peaceful life, your host and founder of the Healing from Emotional Abuse philosophy, Marissa F. Cohen. Welcome back to the Bob Culture Podcast, Breaking Through Our Silence Connection. I'm Marissa, and I am the host of Breaking Through Our Silence, and I'm here with Rissa Pappas and Jen Cassell and Rob Crowther from the Bob Culture Podcast. So let's go around and introduce ourselves just so everyone knows who everyone's voice is. Ladies first, please. Yeah, you said my name first, so I'm going first. Uh, Rissa Pappas, um, I'm a wrestling, pro wrestling commentator, ring announcer, and all-around non-idiot. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'm Jen Casal. I am over here at the CZW Academy. Um, I am head of HR over here. Um, and I have been in wrestling, the wrestling world for about, I guess, five years now. I am uh, Rob Crother, host of the Bob Culture Podcast, senior editor of thepopbreak.com, and super major mark that Rissa and Jen are probably very sick of. <laughs> impossible no i was gonna say and marissa no i'm just kidding no yeah well pop, that's no, you're mostly sick of me <laughs> that's not true so i'm i'm actually really intrigued um rissa and jen brought up an interesting point to rob and i one day about customs wrestling to which i have never heard of but apparently is really big in the wrestling scene so we're going to talk about that and how that can lead to sexual assault and sexualization of female wrestlers so i would love if rissa or jen would start us off because i don't even know where to start here well jen i think i think you have some kind of uh insights into maybe the the somewhat history of it insofar as we're aware Yes, but I kind of wanted to get just, um, you know, a little bit of your your viewpoint on it because the because customs is something that is, it's a hush-hush subject. It's something that like no one wants to talk about, that no one kind of knows about. Um, and as I was saying kind of earlier is that you can do a search for customs wrestling on the internet and nothing comes up. Mm -hmm. So it's something that is not really talked about until you either get into the wrestling world and you know, someone approaches you and says, um, you know, as I know it happened to you, Rissa, that said like, hey, do you want to do customs wrestling? And yeah. you're like, well, I don't even know what that is. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so and, I can I can talk to about that experience maybe by way of introduction because I was I was initially clueless as I'm sure a significant portion of your audience would be. So I was in a locker room. I was approached by somebody who gave me a handout, and they said, "Do do you know how to take bumps?" And I said, yeah, sure. And for, for the uninitiated, taking a bump just means, can you fall down in the ring without hurting yourself and make it look like someone hit you? <laughs> so I, I said, yeah. And I, my, I kind of made the assumption that they were asking because they wanted to maybe put it in some kind of a storyline. So I was ring announcing. So I thought maybe they were going to be an ultra bad guy and knock me out as the ring announcer, which is kind of an, a no-no. Only really awful bad guys do that in wrestling because normally, you know, referees and ring announcers were kind of off limits. So that's what I assumed they were asking for. And then they handed me this piece of paper and they said, no, 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 th uh, this is for customs. And they gave me a handout and it basically just had a bunch of categories of like things that I would consent to do in a wrestling match on camera. And I did, I still kind of didn't understand. So they finally said like customs and I was like, oh, and I immediately became very um, <laughs> defensive and withdrawn and very skeeved out. And I just said, oh, no, 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 thank you. Not, not interested. And prior to that, my only knowledge of, of customs was that, like basically, uh, you know, the rumor mill that is all professional wrestling, indie wrestling. It's, I mean, it's very, it's very chatty. It's very like, 
caddy um for for being male dominated it's very much like everybody talking smack on everybody else i heard so and so does customs and i was like well i don't know what that means like custom matches custom matches being things that people are paying money for and therefore dictating what goes on in those matches and they're not for anybody else they're just for the person who pays for them and i you know you i i i would say I leave it up to your imagination because that's really essentially what it means. It can be completely innocuous. It can be just like, hey, I really want to see these two people specifically have a match and I'm, gonna, I'm willing to pay to have, to be the only person who has that match. Or it can, you know, it can range from relatively innocuous to basically full on pornography. I've only ever been approached about this one time. And that was it. And I said no, and it was never brought up again. But, but that's that's basically my personal experience only. And I, and I very much assume that <laughs> as a non-wrestler, I'm not the general person who's being asked that. So Jen can probably speak to it from a wrestler's perspective because they're much more the ones who are being asked to do these custom matches. Yes, and I think, um, you know, the one thing about it that is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit strange, especially there's so much more nuance to this, like right now, um, especially with the COVID era that we are now in, because there is a lot more stuff that's just going directly to tape because we can't have audiences. So now what custom wrestling is, is almost like a whole lot wider because there is a lot more just like actual custom kind of wrestling going on um, that is completely innocuous. And even in the customs world, you have that. It does range everywhere from, you know, where most of the time, even in the matches that are very, um, very oddly specific, like let's say all I want to, you know, it's a match full of pile drivers. Um, the girls will still just wear, they'll wear a lot more than they would wear their gear. They'll wear, you know, the sweatpants and a t-shirt. Um, it's a really weird, weird kind of world. But um, to me, it was very fascinating. And I kind of wanted to understand a little bit better how, how it got to be that way. Um, so I kind of looked into the, the history a little bit and I wanted to kind of take like a bird's eye view of wrestling. Um, and I looked a little bit more specifically on the women's wrestling side. However, I think it's really important to note that, um, the business for men's custom wrestling is just as strong as it is for women. So there is no, you know, beating around the bush that this is, you know, just something that is a, a women's thing. I can only bring you, you know, a woman's direct perspective of it because that's what I am um but so I really looked back into you know you look all the way back into the golden era of wrestling which is like 80 years ago at this point you have um people like Mildred Burke and Mae Weston in the 40s and the 50s who they even challenged men at that time which was like really crazy and different for the society that they, that we were living in which was very you know uh, very kind of stringent at that time um, but then I think a lot of people have heard all of the stories about um, Mula too, who has kind of gotten a much more of a bad rap in the more recent years, um, where, you know, they say that she was sending people out um, to, you know, have private matches at people's houses and things like that. Um, and then that was going on back then. I wasn't there, so I can't say if it was or not. But um, like I said, those are those are certainly some of the stories that you hear and that you see in print. Um, but it was also, I think, part of the industry, certainly at that point, um, especially with Mula and how ladies got kind of made in wrestling at that time. Then you move into like the 60s and the 70s, and in the 70s, they were trying to kind of save the magazines because the business for all the magazines were dying. So in 73, Stan Weston, um, he had the Sports Review Wrestling Magazine that was like uh, on the brink of collapsing. So he started this thing called Apartment Wrestling, which was featured in his magazine and it was women in scantily clad or they were in their, um, they were in lingerie and they were wrestling. And of course, this sold by hotcakes. Um, so I think that when I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, this seems like something that's very close to what, 
you know, why people would want customs because it's in an apartment, it's close to your house. It's, you know, that's like a personal thing that you just have. Um, so in that way, that that's where I'm like, hmm, I kind of see this in that. And the ironic thing is that um, for WWF at the time, it was Vince Sr. Um, was in charge and he did not like this. Um, he was trying to cut ties with the magazine um, because he thought that it was just, you know, he thought that it was smut and, smut and whatever and didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but then we move on to looking at WWF and to WWE going into, you look in like the Attitude Era and the Ruthless Aggression Era. So from like 90s to 2000s, um, where it was very much adult entertainment on regular TV. Raw and panty matches were standard fare. Um, so this was in everyone's living room, um, you know, and not just in wrestling, but like Jerry Springer was very popular um, and shows of that nature. So I think when you come into this viewpoint of like, oh my God, this, this is like very sexual and crazy. Like, why would somebody be doing this in wrestling today? This is like totally out of whack. Well, if you look back some years, this was just like totally normal on, you know, your TV, a couple of, you know, regular TV, a couple of nights a week. Um, and things didn't really change until it went very family, you know, things started to get more um, TV PG. Um, and, you know, of course, we always refer back to WWE because they're kind of the, you know, especially at that time, um, there was really no competition. Um, and it wasn't until I think they went PG in 2008 or 2009. Um, and then things started to like settle down. There's less blood. People got some more clothes on. Nobody's like ripping somebody else's clothes off into their underwear or having a mud wrestling match anymore. Things are starting to settle down a little bit. And then, you know, we didn't have the women's revolution until 2015. So if we're looking back in something that has an 80 year, a hundred year history to only go back five years to when things got to where they are right now, it's hard for a lot of younger people to see that like things weren't always the way that they are right now. So I think something like customs can look very shocking when really I think a lot of customs, you know, that's going on is, is very similar to, you know, regular wrestling that you saw on your TV, you know, 10, 15 years ago, which is not to be like, Hey, that's great. You know, <laughs> but it's definitely, you know, it's not the kind of wrestling that, you know, is for everybody. Um, but it was for some people and some people still want to see that. So there's definitely a market for it. And I, like I said, I, you know, I'm looking at it from the women's perspective, but from the male perspective, they, like I said, that market is really, really big. And I think the problem with why it continues to be around and really continues to be a thing is that there is a, a lot more money in it for, for a lot of wrestlers than there is for them to go and work a regular indie show. Um, and I think that's like the big kind of crux of the issue to me. That's very interesting. Um, so I'll play the dummy uh, because again, this a lot of this is very news to me slash devil's advocate. Uh, I'll come at you guys this way. I'm trying to find the line here because when, when I hear about like, even I feel like the word customs right now, like it, like it's just bad, like negative all the way through and through. But Rissa mentioned like, Hey, you know, sometimes there is, you know, a story or there's, you know, some, a match that people want to see like for legit, like storyline reasons, you know, Jen, no stranger to being in a faction. What happens to factions? Again, this is purely storyline what happens to factions they they break up or someone turns or you know that seth rollins chair shot from behind you know um and then you know you want to see those former tag partners face each other so you know and jen you also brought up we're living in this 2020 covid world right now where hey like let's face it like the indie you know it's hard to do indie shows we're, we're lucky to have these these drive-in shows that we've had we're lucky to have these bring your own chair shows i'm so thankful that i've been going to these shows i really need it right now i'm super appreciative uh to the indies that has just been so so great to me but my question for you guys is uh is it all bad where's the line you know um, you know, obviously like the stuff you guys mentioned about it getting very weird and perverted, um, you know, obviously that's a no, no, you know, we've, we've interviewed people on the show. No, I'm not name dropping right now, but we've heard some really weird things that they get in their DMs, some very like strange stuff. So where's the line? Like from someone who's in the business right now that is trying to put food on the table and have like face a former tag partner or face a former faction member. Um, and then, you know, obviously this very dark web kind of stuff that you mess um, 
well, you the, mentioned, like where's the line? The line is at the comfort level of every individual performer, but unfortunately that line is in a different place for everybody. And so it it's infinitely complicated because there are infinite amounts of wrestling personalities out there and some of them totally fine with sex work. Some of them, like me, I was very bothered that I had even been approached for that. I was, I was very offended and immediately incredibly uncomfortable. And if it hadn't have been a woman that was asking me, if it had been a man that approached me, I would have knocked him the fuck out. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, trying to be badass or anything. Like that would have been my reaction. Cause like, how dare you? Because it was a woman, I was just immediately uncomfortable because to me, being approached by a woman is basically a woman being like, hey, get in on this. I'm vouching for this. And even if that's the case, and, and I'm sure, I'm really honestly sure that there is plenty of custom stuff that is done in an environment where it's actually safe and in a place where you don't necessarily have to ever speak or be in contact with the person who's asking for it. Like you can, you can put all of those like checkpoints in, but for my personal comfort level, any approach is too much. Like that's because to me, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here for wrestling. What customs is to a large extent is sex work. That's not what I'm here for. So some people are totally fine with that and it makes a ton of money. It makes a, a, a ton more money than any wrestler is ever going to get. Hot dogs and handshakes is a, is a, used to be <laughs> at least a pretty frequent payment. So, um, but it's very difficult to say where that line is. And it's, I was, I think I was kind of bothered by how normalized it was being kind of a person who hadn't been involved for a very long time. Like there are people who've been in the business for years and like to your point, Rob, you'll hear, you know, the, the people that you're interviewing will tell you like the things that come into my inbox, the things that people request of me. And to them, I don't think that that's, that's not, that's not the mentality. They're just like, I'm going to shoot my shot and see what happens. I'm going to just ask um, and, and maybe they'll say yes. And that's as far as they'll think about it because to what, to Jen's point, a lot of these people tend to be, tend to be older because if you're young, you probably don't have the money to be making this ask. So it tends to be, you know, a slightly older crowd that watched wrestling for years and years when it was bra and panty matches. So now they're not seeing it anymore. And they're like, well, why can't I see the bra and panty stuff anymore? And so they're like, well, I'm going to ask because the older you get, the bolder you get. And so they're like, well, I don't, I'm not going to not ask because that's what I want. But they're not thinking about the implication of what asking even does. I mean, I'm in my 30s. I was, I was not cool, very not cool with being asked. But I'm okay. Like, it's not remotely the worst thing that's ever happened to me. But imagine if you're like 17, 18 years old and you're going to a wrestling school and this is your whole world and then somebody asks you that and tries to, you know, make it seem like, oh, it's no big deal. Like that would, that would have rocked my world as an 18 year old. And some, you know, a lot of this talent really, really young. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, especially for the young people and the new people in the business is that like we were saying, this is such a kind of a, a, a sort of, and I, I've never had anybody talk about it or approach it in the business in a way where it was like, undercover or trying to get anybody to do something that they didn't want to do and I think in a lot of ways it's it is wonderful that it is at your own personal discretion that's the great thing about things being you know an independent contractor is that you know if you're like hey that's not my jam then you don't have to do that um but I think money is very alluring to people um and I think also like you're saying this is a environment where things are your whole world so it can often you know and the conversations that people talk about getting into things that that are specifically sex work is that sometimes that can be a very slippery slope and before you know it you know what you know what are you doing for what but I don't want to you know say that like all customs is sex work because I think there are those things that are very very innocuous and are fine but 
there's not really like, you know, like you're saying, like just as having this conversation is going to shed a lot of light on this subject for a lot of people. And I think we all just need to be focused on taking care of our, taking care of each other because that's best and the right thing to do. Um, so I think things need to be honest. And I think those conversations need to be like really clear with people that are new and coming into the business. Yeah. I don't think it's like a dirty little secret or anything. Everybody is so used to it. Everybody is so jaded about it. People are being like, there's, there's, um, there's, there's people who have told me that they get people who message them and it starts out just like, Oh, I'm a really big fan. It starts out really innocuous. And then it ends up being like cyber wrestling, which is apparently a thing that they're like, Ooh, yeah. Put me in a chokehold baby. And it's like, Oh God, get the fuck out of here. Come on. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, sexting. Basically, yeah. but it's like wrestle sexting, but it, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's such a broad spectrum and it's definitely not all sex work. A lot of it is just like, Hey, especially, you know, Jen was talking earlier, like we're in a COVID time right now. There's not a ton of actual shows running. So if I'm a person with a couple hundred extra bucks and it's just like, Hey, if you two are comfortable getting into a, a room with each other, I would love to pay you just to see a match. Cause there's just, I mean, if you've been watching WWE lately, it's not, it's not so, not so great the quality, <laughs> the quality the quality of what we're left with is not super great right now unless you get to go out to an actual show in which case you know performers like jen are working their asses off because they know like <laughs> hey we might be the only wrestling for a month so i'm gonna make it count let's um, get it when we can <laughs> yeah plus yeah you just you just really want to be there and you really want to be involved but it's it has the it's it's a it, it can really be a a slippery slope kind of situation and people don't know who they're asking when they're asking these things they don't know the the trauma that people might have had and unfortunately a lot of you know girls experience you know some kind of trauma in their life and being asked and being put into that position or being I don't think anybody's I really don't think anybody's being coerced by anyone in the industry but if your inbox is constantly filling up with guys saying disgusting stuff to you, oh, I'm going to pay you for this, I'm going to pay you for that, like, that's got to affect you. You know, like, that's got to, you know, mess you up at least a little bit. So, I, yeah, well, and then there, I think there's, you know, because I definitely have had my fair share of those inboxes, people, and also, you know, for cosplay too, that was definitely a big thing. Um, and you know, people are kind of, there's people that are willing to do anything for money and people that are willing to pay you for anything. Um, and that's, you know, I hate to say something like that's the way the world goes around, but sometimes, unfortunately it is. Um, yeah. but I, I think, you know, my, my thing that I think is that we have this kind of opportunity right now with the COVID era to, you know, to turn this into a great thing. I think we can really turn it into, like we were saying, we have, um, there is stuff going on out there. We have, um, We Want Wrestling is something that I'm involved in, which is um, a taping that goes on. Um, and Beyond used to do tapings that are similar to this. And now they're, you know, a nice, a nice healthy company. Um, but, you know, there's, we have tapings of matches that are organized by one of our trainers here. And then they're put on Patreon for people to subscribe to. But there are different levels of that too. Whereas like you can, if you know, if you're one of the top tiers of the subscribers, you can write in and request a match. So that is really, you know, that is, it is a custom match at that point. But what we're doing is organized and it's being, you know, overseen by someone who is, you know, a, a trainer here with us. So we know that we're in that safe space. And by the way, it's gotten the possibility of doing this kind of stuff has only gotten safer over time. Um, there's like an old adage that like the, the porn industry and like the, the sex work industry tends to be on the, you know, ahead of the curve on technology and whatever. I mean, now every time I'm on Facebook and I'm looking at wrestlers profiles and stuff, there's like, now there's only fans accounts popping up and what's, there's another one too. I can't remember the name of it, but there's like two, two main ones now where people can just, you know, there's that, there's, there's like literally platforms now for transactions that used to be done in very underhanded and confusing and inappropriate ways. Now there's literally platforms for it. So it, by talking about it, I, I hope that it can be something 
it just was a, that was one of the many things that the culture of silence in wrestling was covering up. And to Jen's point, like, this could be a healthy thing. This could be a good thing. This could be, this could actually be okay. As long as we're not like covering it up anymore so that people are only finding out about it when they're being taken by surprise like me or when people start inboxing me and making really disgusting requests and stuff like that's not the way <laughs> it's almost like you know when your parents sit you down and give you the talk you want <laughs> you want the parents to sit you down and give you the talk you don't want to find out a horrible way in school you want to you know what i mean it's it's i would rather us be kind of bringing it out in the open and having a healthy discussion of it and saying like look this is what it this is what it can unfortunately be but on the plus side, this is something that if you feel empowered to do it and you feel well adjusted to do it and you have very clear lines of your own in which you're in control, you know, you can do you can do whatever it is that you want. But not being exposed to it in the right way can be like, you know, traumatizing, whereas kind of being open and honest about it and being more pragmatic about it can actually be beneficial. Absolutely. Um, real quick. So I'm thinking about this and to, to Jen's point, again, I, as I've found out many times in my life, very ignorant, but I, you know, when you, when we talk about these, these matches where it's, you know, we can have one person versus the other person, or we can make these matches. You mentioned Patreon, you mentioned we want wrestling. Uh, I think I saw recent, I think it was, we want wrestling. I, I saw a matchup that I was like, Oh, cool. Like these guys are finally like fighting. That's really cool. And in this, like we keep saying in this 2020, uh, era you know where we don't really have live events we don't have as much wrestling luckily here in new jersey i've, I've been going to like a show every week at, you know safely of course um but i've, I've been very fortunate i've seen some really cool things and had some cool opportunities but i think also the way that i looked at it when we started on this topic was like hey, this is a way for fans to get the pencil. You know, I, I've rarely had the opportunity to get the pencil. I know a lot of indie wrestlers like want to get the pencil, you know, for their, for their character, for their career, all that kind of stuff. We all do. So that's the way I've always looked at it. Um, so you guys kind of mentioned this, uh, you know, I asked where the line was, but what is the healthy way to do this? Because like, I feel like now this word has like such a negative connotation. Like we, we do have Patreon. We do have We Want Wrestling. Like what about like, just like the fans that just like want to watch like, two guys fight or two chicks fight or a guy fight a chick or whatever it is storyline wise. It's hard to say because like I said, we don't have it. Like we don't have a ton of things that are structured and you kind of don't know what is what at this point. Um, and you also don't kind of know the quality of what you're getting unless you have, you know, like a preview of it. So if you have something where you're like, Hey, you know, go watch, this is what, you know, this is whatever it is. Companies, stuff like you know go take a look at it and then you're like oh okay i can see that this is wrestling or oh okay i see that this is two chicks rolling around in their underwear or two dudes that are sitting in holds for an uncomfortably long time um <laughs> it, you know that no, um that i that's really you know a good way to identify it so i think it's just a matter of um i think we're really right now we're on the cusp of this just starting to happen where people and companies are kind of getting the, the spark and the idea to go out there and do this in like an awesome way to go out and do this and make it good. And there's, you know, there's also like the rise of, you know, I'm obviously very passionate about um, theatrical matches. Um, and that's something that's happening. There's um, uh, one of the companies that does this, I think they're called Phil uh, Philly Street Fights. Um, they're on YouTube and they do some theatrical matches that are kind of fun. Um, you know, there is, like I said, there is, I think, opportunities for things to be done really, really well, kind of using the same format and using the same platform. Um, you know, I don't think that it's ever going to go away, that people are going to, you know, want things for their own gratification, whether it be like, you know, very outwardly sexual, or if it's just a matter of like, a, you know, like a weird control okay. thing. Yeah, like that's always going to be there. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think that our action should be to like, oh God, we got to stamp this out because I don't necessarily, like, I haven't had the experience where I've known where that it's been really hurting anybody. But I think, like I said, open, honest conversation is always the best way to kind of like get stuff on the table and just make people aware of like, hey, this is a thing, you know, be aware of it. Watch out for yourself, watch out for each other. Right. We kind of have, as, as much as COVID blows, obviously, you know, we kind of are now in an 
in an interesting and unique place where all the stuff that you always wished you could do, but you couldn't necessarily do it in, you know, in one match in part of a nine match card where specific beats have to be hit at specific times and specific storylines have to happen. I mean, if you strip all of that stuff away and you go, I just really want to do a match where this happens, like to Jen's point about, you know, theatrical matches and stuff like you can, you can actually do that now and just do it as a one-off. So I think if we kind of start looking at wrestling a little bit more broad mindedly where we're not thinking about it in the traditional you know, there's going to be a nine match card and there's going to be an intermission in the middle. And it's going to like, if we, if we kind of rip away that structure and just go, okay, but what do we actually want to do? What, we, what do we really just want to do if we didn't have any of those constrictions? Like you have the potential for some really cool stuff. And you know what? As much people, people who are quote in the business love to talk crap about people who are not quote in the business. Oh, they're just a fan. Oh, they're just a fan. I've never subscribed to that. I think it's elitist bullshit. Because you know what? Everybody who's in the business started as a fan. So to talk shit on people who are just trying to be where you are and they are currently where you were, that's kind of, I always found that to be mean spirited and shitty. So I think the fans could be, right. And the fans are now in a position where, you know, you could be taking that money and go, I really want to see, you know, I want to, you know, I want to, I'm a huge fan of uh, Mother Endless. I'm going to give her money to do whatever she wants. I just want to be able to let her do it. I'm going to fund her Patreon and make sure she can just put on whatever match. Cause I love her. And um, I think she's so cool. I don't care what she puts together. Cause I know it's going to be awesome. Like we're now in that kind of era where we can, we have that flexibility right now because there are so many shows not running, which is the potential for that is really amazing. Um, yeah, and I think that's a good point. Like, there is nothing, and I uh, say this, you know, in in every time I have put a team together in business and led a group of people um, in a business, is that there is no business without the customer, and that's what our the fans are the customers. So there wouldn't be as much as people love wrestling, um, there wouldn't be any wrestling if there wasn't any fans. And now there just needs to be that kind of different way to to reach the fans. Um, and I think those platforms are there, and it's just kind of like. I, I, you know, it's almost like the custom is almost kind of paved the way for this really cool thing that I think is where, you know, is going to be the dawn of, of kind of the new thing in wrestling. How do you think it would affect the wrestling community and the fans and the wrestlers uh, and the industry if there was like a strict no sexual objectification policy or some sort of some sort of. I don't know, way to implement the like lack of sexualizing people and put it into practice. Do you think that that would affect the industry? Well, I don't think that's honestly possible because the unfortunate flip side of there's no rules and we are now in the wild, wild west of wrestling where we can all just propose whatever we want. And if we have the money, we can do it. Unfortunately, that leaves the door wide open for people to just continue to inbox you crazy shit because it's not when we talk about all the matches that we could potentially be doing without the constrictions of doing it for a specific wrestling federation. Like that's, that's the really good freedom. The, the adverse freedom is people with, with the, with these new platforms with people having Patreons and only fans accounts and, and, you know, cameos and all this kind of stuff is that people now feel more empowered than ever to make really inappropriate asks. And so I don't, I don't know that there's a way that you can just cut that out. I think realistically, the only thing to do is to try to change wrestling culture from the inside to not put up with that kind of shit as much anymore and to kind of try to be more protective of each other because you're never going to have fans stop saying disgusting stuff to you. It's just unrealistic to try to control fans. But in terms of actual wrestling, like, like any organization, like the change kind of comes from the top. We really kind of need, you know, if WWE wants to continue to be top dog in the wrestling world, they really got to get their shit together and start really modeling the behavior that, because they like it or not, they're old and they're dinosauric and a lot of people have a problem with them and AEW is the future, well, whatever. 
okay, but WWE is still on top and that's the reality for as long as it is. So until it stops being the reality, they are the standard bearers. So if they're not acting right, which they're not right now, if they're not acting right, we, I, cannot, I cannot foresee everybody else suddenly getting their shit together. Maybe on an individual federation level, you'll have, you know, like, you know, Titan Championship Wrestling, they're trying their hardest with the goddesses of war. They're trying really hard to be above board. They have improvements that they could always be making. And, you know, any smart federation will be aware of that and will be constantly working on it. But they're trying as hard as they can to make sure that they're creating a safe environment for the talent. On an individual federation level, that's great, but I can't assume that everybody is going to take that accountability onto themselves without being prompted in really unfortunate ways, such as what happened with the, you know, hashtag speaking out. So I think it's, I think a lot of it is, you know, we need to, you know, I've, I've never not been vocal, but, you know, remain, you know, people like Jen and I need to remain vocal about these things, try to be action oriented, try to be solutions oriented and make people feel like, you know, this is not the hardest thing in the world to do because it's not, but we need, you know, WWE and AEW and impact. I mean, they, um, they, you know, they're, they're the ones on TV. So as long as they're the ones on TV with, with big multi-million dollar contracts and whatever, um, they're going to be looked to. So it's a, you know, like any organization trying to make cultural changes, it's modeling from the top and grassroots work from the bottom. And hopefully it meets together and then you have a better culture, a more inclusive culture. It's weird because there is definitely like a kind of like un, um, unfair standard and stigma that happens with the customs where, you know, I, you know, had people say, well, don't, you know, you know, don't do customs. You should never do customs. You know, it's not good for your reputation in wrestling, blah, 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 blah. And then the same person turns on the TV and is looking at, you know, Charlotte Flair and talking about, you know, like how, you know, how expletive, expletive, I just like to get in there, yada, 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 you know? So I think that people just, you know, and in the same breath will like, sexualize somebody um but at the same time condemn somebody for kind of there's, being there's that a same. disconnect yes that's like that was like that when i had that experience when that happened and so, and somebody was like no 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 don't do customs and then at the same time was watching you know wwe and sexualizing somebody i was like man this is this is just what this shit is huh <laughs> and some some for, for the record some uh a lot a lot of people have done customs work. Your favorite wrestlers have probably done customs work. That doesn't Absolutely. mean that they've gone full on pornographic, but I can, I can nearly guarantee you that the people that you idolize, your top 10 people, probably at least two of them have done some kind of customs work. Seth Rollins has done customs work. You can find it, it's on YouTube, okay? It's there, I'm not giving anything away. You can look them up and see pictures of his dick too i mean it's, it's out there he's okay with it at this point he makes millions of dollars he's fine but that's what i'm like when he was younger and when he was hungry and when he wasn't signed yet and he was just a semi-popular indie guy that's when that's when they're hitting your inbox the hardest is when you're a rising star and for him he didn't do anything gross it was just a really awkward looking match with very inappropriate ring gear that's all it was um but that's, that was, you know, that was his decision. He was very young. Maybe he would say now that he was too young to have made that decision. Only by being really open about this and bringing it up and, and kind of having these sort of conversations with these younger talent, that's the only way that they're going to come out of it unscathed or not confused or not traumatized. I mean, if you're getting asked to do weird stuff, and you say yes to one thing, but you're young and impressionable, then the one thing can quickly become, yeah, but would you also do this? And yeah, I mean, the possibility for escalation is high the younger you are and the more vulnerable you are. So there's nothing at all wrong with sex work. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's a very honest way to make a living. So <laughs> I think, we, you know, the, but the point is how you are introduced to sex work has a lot to do with 
whether or not sex work is good for you specifically. And so that line is only is something that only you can determine as an individual. And that's something that only you can determine when you're in a place where you feel like you're not being coerced or, or hassled or, you know, pushed into it in any way. So only by being very open and honest about it as a culture are, are we going to be able to equip these young wrestlers to be able to handle it when the ask does come, because it's going to come. So what gets me, and I agree with you on everything that you've said. I mean, sex work is, it's very honest, you know, you, your heart's literally on your sleeve, but you know, I guess my concern is that the people who are so young and so new and so hungry will be allured, lured in by the money. So I guess, like you said, it's about setting that boundary. How do we teach the newbies, the youngins, like the people who are going to be approached and will most likely not be equipped with the strength and boldness to be like, hell no, that's not my thing. You know, how do we equip them with those boundary setting confidence tools? Literally the same brain, Marissa, literally the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes back to um, our education and something that when I um, talk to young people, old people, old people about sexual harassment, one of the things that I always talk about is setting boundaries um, and how to do that with someone um, in a way that's like clear cut and dry and just like straight across. How do you, sorry, there's a loud part going by. My apologies. Um, but yeah, so setting, uh, people need to know how to set their boundaries um, in wrestling. And it's, that's not just a conversation in wrestling that's about something like customs, but it's a lot of times about something like safety too. So it's an, a very important um, conversation that needs to be had with wrestlers is that how do you tell people that you're not comfortable taking a move because you don't want to look like you're not the cool guy by not taking their big move. But if you're not sure that you can take that safely, you need to have, be able to have that conversation with them and you need to have that confidence to set your boundaries or you may end up very severely injured. Um, so in exactly that same way, you're going to have that thing talk about something that you wouldn't be comfortable um, doing. And that's the same thing with angles too, because a lot of times you might get put in an angle, you know, in a regular show that you might not be comfortable in. It, you know, whether it be a sexual thing, a political thing, or anything else, um, it's really important um, because what we do in wrestling is entertainment. Um, things can be so up in the air and they can be so different than things that you would encounter in a school environment or a business environment. Um, so just teaching people how to have those conversations and being that one of those being comfortable, being uncomfortable things and learning how to say no in a polite way um that's you know you know sometimes you're not like hell no oh my god why would you want me to do that that's disgusting or just like hey you know that's not really for me um but it's about finding i like to teach people how to find um information how to ask open-ended questions of other people so if somebody approaches you you know like the um rissa had that experience when somebody approaches you like that how to ask you know you're like what is this because it isn't it wasn't very clear um, until you looked at the paper and you saw all those things. Um, but how to ask those open-ended questions of people when they are approaching you with things. So you can find out exactly what you're, you're, you're getting into there. I think it needs to be taught in the wrestling schools, honestly. I think that that needs to be part of the spiel of when you're first, you know, when you're a new student or whatever, um, and you're training. Because just in the same way that any good wrestling school will prepare you about how to network and how to, you know, put yourself out there as a performer and make connections like, okay, but what are the implications of making those connections? Not all of those connections are going to, you know, not all those encounters are going to go the way that you want them to go. And the more popular you get, the more unfortunately in demand you're going to be in ways that you did not anticipate. So um, I think... Yeah, I, I keep coming back to it, but the just in all ways, I would say this to fans as well as to fellow performers, it's just be considerate and be kind and don't assume that you know anything about what the person that you're asking or talking to is going through and, you know, can you can you be helpful to them instead of harmful to them at any given time? Because a lot of it 
fans just really want to connect with the performers that they love and they're not necessarily going at it in a in a way that they think that they're being bad they because why would they want to do that they wouldn't want to hurt the person that they care about and they look up to and whatever they wouldn't want to hurt that person's feelings so they're not always aware that there's a disconnect sometimes rob did you hear about the whole thing with sonia deville how a fan broke into her apartment and tried to kidnap her like last week yeah, I, I saw the thing, and and I'm sitting there. I read the story. I'm like, ah, oh, she could, yeah, uh, she could handle it. She's tough. She, but then I saw like he had weaponry and all this stuff, and it's very crazy and crossing the line. And obviously, you know, thought, you know, thoughts are with Sonia, and I think Mandy was there at the time as well, or uh, roommates or nieces and nephews involved as well. Yeah, somebody um, was there, so, and they and they yeah. they peaced out in the car and called the cops, and he was Goodness. still. He would, but that's how you can tell that the that he was not in his right mind. He was still there by the time the cops showed up. He didn't even have the the mental wherewithal to like get out of there and not incriminate himself. He admitted to everything. He's just so deeply obsessed with her, and you know these things that start out really innocent can turn really really bad sometimes. So, um, you know. I will gladly tell someone who says things that are inappropriate to me to, you know, go screw or whatever, you know, uh, th and there are varying degrees of niceness that I will deploy <laughs> on how they come at me. But I don't know that I always am getting through. So I think a lot of this female wrestlers and female talent are not nearly the only people being asked these kinds of things. I think, um, that they probably get hit more often for these kinds of requests. Um, but men, all, all male talent get approached about this kind of stuff eventually as well. Um, so it's men and women that are being asked, but the people asking overwhelmingly are men. And so I feel like male talent who are who are looked up to a lot like you know women shouldn't be the only ones having to field these kind of requests and like figure out what to do about them like we need we need as many allies as possible and it goes both ways as well like if if you know there are a couple of people a couple of younger guys that i know who are in wrestling and if they ever were uncomfortable and they came to me i would try my best to help them and i would like to think that it goes both ways but you know, we really have to look out for each other. And men, um, like if I'm on Facebook and I'm being harassed, there are several male wrestlers that I feel like I can tag in and be like, this person's being really awful. Can you like help me out here? And unfortunately, a lot of the times, you know, it takes one guy talking to another guy to be like, hey, bro, that's really not actually appropriate. You're really making that person uncomfortable. They, they really kind of have to hear it from another guy a lot of the time. So, um, Rob, we know that, that you're an ally and I, I feel like I could tag you in if necessary on things and I feel like you would you know, you would have my back. Um and there need to be more there need to be more people like that. And you know, if you're a male ally, you know, be super vocal about it because we need to know where you are. When the when the chips are down and we're being like made to feel very uncomfortable or whatever, like we're just looking for a friendly face. So the more vocal about it you can be and the more visual about it you can be, um, that would that goes a long way. Yeah, and one of the things that um, I try to do is also I try to talk with the younger guys that are here. Um, you know, we do some um, the logic experiments and, you know, I'll share with them like too, you know, if it's not something that's like too super inappropriate, but like, hey, this is what was put into my inbox or, mm -hmm. you know, how would you feel this if this came to you? Um, and then we have o those open and honest conversations because um, I think guys' viewpoints from what I've experienced and the feedback that I've gotten um, from a lot of the younger performers is very different, I think, from the girls. Um, and I think that just goes to, you know, kind of show for society where a lot of the guys are like, oh, my God, yeah, I don't care. I would do that for whatever amount of money. Like, that doesn't bother me at all. And then, you know, for me, with the thing that I, I like to do with them is, you know, we talk about it like, well, you know, let's think about how you would feel about this five years from now. How would you feel about this if your mom saw it? How would you feel about, you know, how would your grandma feel about this? How would your, you know, your father, your uncle, or your teachers, what would they say if they saw this? Um, so that you cannot just get, it's not a, just a condemnation of this is right or this is wrong, but really helping people find out where their boundaries are and where their moral compass is on it. 
So it's not just a like, let me jump at this money kind of situation. I watch a lot of really terrible movies. Um, like that, you know, you watch them because it's like, it's, it's great how bad they are. Like, here's how not to make a movie. Um, <laughs> and I actually used to teach a film class where one of the classes was I would show a really terrible movie and then have the class discuss what, what about it made it not a good movie. And occasionally in those really awful movies, you see like a girl with her tits out and I'm like, man, bet she regrets that now. I bet she does like it. And it's those kinds of, that's, that's the kind of decision she's, she's young and perky <laughs> and she was probably coerced. And now, you know, it's 30 years later and there's a, you know, a VHS to digital transfer of her boobs on the internet forever. Like these are the kind of things that people are being approached about at a very, very young age. And, you know, Thank God that we have people like Jen in in the uh, the locker room and and at the training school help helping these people out and asking these kind of questions. But there needs to be a Jen in every locker room. So that's um, a Jen and a Rissa. So yeah, we can't be in yeah. every locker room at one time. So we uh, <laughs> we need um, we need a lot of people to uh, to kind of step up and say that they'll be that person that they'll have those kinds of uh, courageous conversations. That's awesome. I uh, I had something I wanted to say and I don't remember what it was now. So sorry. I know. I'm sorry. We're like throwing so much stuff at you guys. Rob, I did, I, I did want to bring something up to you, Rob, because when we initially started having this conversation, I feel like you were kind of gobsmacked that this was a thing that was happening. Like, did we ruin wrestling for you at all? <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, you hit it right on the head. I think both of my my questions initially kind of summed it up, but it was like, oh yeah, I want to see this guy fight this guy. Like that makes a lot of sense, you know. Like they used to tag together. Like that's cool. It makes a lot of sense. It's 2020. We can't really have shows like putting food on people's table. Yeah, no problem. And then it got weird. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I learned something today. <laughs> So we need a Jen and Arissa in every locker room, and we need more wrestling fans like Rob. Yes. In the, in the crowds, yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Maybe. I think if, if I could just make one plea to, to fans, if any fans are listening, please, especially now in COVID times, like, please don't assume that you can just run up and give me a hug. Just because you spend, you know, hours, like, sifting through the photos I have on Facebook doesn't mean that I have any idea who you are. I so apologize for that, Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, it it's it's like it's that's what I'm saying. Like there is there can really kind of be a disconnect between the dialogue you have in your head and then you know. But you know, unfortunately for for guys, the way that that really that hyper you know obsession is sometimes it can kind of turn really weird and awkward and potentially very inappropriate. And in the case of the guy who's obsessed with Sonya Deville, potentially even violent. Whereas I think women just like write fan fiction. Like they're very much more chill about their obsessions. I think I think guys could kind of take a, a page out of their book in terms of fandom. Like go on Tumblr and see what like healthy and super obsessed fandom can look like and you know, not be you know, they can be as gross as they wanna be because it's fiction. And they're not, you know, you don't these are not people who are like stalking, you know, their their favorite wrestlers and going into their house and sitting in their house and waiting for the cops to show up. Very aggressive side note, Tumblr is actually owned by Pornhub. So hey, you can what? Just, yep, yeah. you can just read what you see on Pornhub on Tumblr. Uh, that was news to me. I learned something today too. I'm a wealth of dumb knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it is, that is really interesting though. Yeah, there was a big controversy about that, but I don't remember what specifically it was. I think it actually was like Tumblr and Pornhub were like trying to do something that was actually kind of sex positive together. Um, I don't remember, but I, I think, you know, we're, we're in a place where like back pages was a, a, you know, a relatively legitimate and some, you know, more or less safe kind of way for sex work transactions to happen. And now that that's gone, now we have, you know, we're, we are adapting. So, you know, if you want to engage in sex work and you are an adult and you are, um, 
not operating out of a place of mental illness and you know you're of sound mind and body and you just want to show it off and flaunt it and make buku bucks doing it you know power to you there's there's so many ways now it's actually pretty amazing it's just you know have those honest discussions about it beforehand and you know educate yourself about it google has everything good and bad so you can find out the the pros and cons of just about anything but being open and having honest discussions about it like you know finding out about custom shouldn't be just like a you know a whisper game that happens it should be something that is talked about because you know I would love for people to know that that's coming before that starts hitting their inbox. I would love for I would love for people to be aware that this is a thing and that with fame no matter how minor there comes um inappropriateness. So I I'm 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 really thankful to uh to both of you for agreeing to have us come on and and speak about this. Thank yes, you I'm really glad that we have this conversation as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. I know I learned a ton. I can probably speak for Rob that he also learned a ton. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. And um, I think that talking about this stuff, like you said, Rosa, is really, really important because not only does it educate fans and people that are outside the wrestling world, but it also educates the people that want to be in the wrestling world. So thank you guys for being so open and honest. And thank you, Jen, for working with people and teaching them about customs and setting boundaries. And thank you, Rissa, for being such a prominent voice in the community. And thank you, Rob, for being an awesome super fan who just wants to innocently watch people wrestle because he enjoys it. It's all I have. It's all I have, Marissa. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, you have to check out www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. That's www.marissafaycohen.com backslash private dash coaching. Marissa would love to develop a made for you healing plan to heal from emotional abuse. She does all the work and you just show up. Stop feeling stuck, alone, and hurt and live a free, confident, and peaceful life. Don't forget to subscribe to the Healing from Emotional Abuse podcast and follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash Marissa F. Cohen and Instagram at marissa.fay.cohen. We'd love to see you there.